Hello, welcome back. And welcome all the way from California, Jyotika Singh. She's the VP of Data Science at ICX, where she and her team work on natural language processing, feature engineering, and all kinds of machine learning. Jyotika has a master's degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, where among other research topics, she worked on signal and speech processing and developed new approaches to remove noise from speech. She shares her findings via her open source projects on GitHub, such as Pi YouTube analysis and Pi audio processing. And that's what Jyotika is talking about today, audio. What is audio data? How to build features and classification models on audio? How to solve these problems in Python? Now is where we find out from the author of Pi Audio Processing herself. So please join me in a hand of virtual applause for Jyotika Singh and classifying audio into types using Python. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, like you mentioned, I'll be talking about classifying audio into types using Python. Before diving right in, I just quickly want to introduce myself. I work as a VP of data science as i6 Media. It's a content and audience intelligence company based in Washington, DC. I'm attaching my social media handles there because I'm going to be posting this slide deck on social media as well on my Twitter account uh, after the talk. Also, in case anybody has any questions that you are unable to ask me during the conference, uh, you can shoot a note out to me on Twitter. Uh, also attaching my LinkedIn and GitHub accounts for reference. I'm also going to be, uh, you know, there's an upcoming book in the summer to fall 2022 that I'm working on, that I'm working on authoring. It's on natural language processing in the real world, which contains um, descriptions about how natural language processing is used across several industry verticals and actually how to implement it using Python. So without further ado, uh, this entire talk uh, will contain a few sections, starting from what is audio, machine learning at a high level, audio features, tools, and using some of these tools, and then classification examples that classify audio into different types across different genres uh, towards the end using the tools that we have discussed previously. So what is audio? Uh, it's essentially a signal that vibrates in the audible frequency range. What does that mean? Well, when I'm talking now and you can hear me through the speakers, uh, those sounds basically create air pressure waves that is then received by our ear and these pressure signals is converted uh, to some responses that our brain can understand and finally recognize the audio as a particular meaning. There are so many great MATLAB tools for just digital signal processing, speech processing and audio processing. Uh, a lot of research that goes on, you know, the first thing where we can actually see the effects of those research is in MATLAB. Given that machine learning is the language of choice for building classification models. Uh, uh, Python is the language of choice there. Uh, there's, there's little few gaps that I noticed in the community when I was trying to build audio classification models and I needed to extract particular features. So in that attempt, uh, there are some open source libraries that are created to do audio processing in Python. Uh, and one of them is also Py Audio Processing, which I'll be talking about the usage of it in a little bit. So what is machine learning at a high level? Uh, it's essentially, we can imagine this as divided into three phases. There's a data phase, there's a training phase, and an evaluation phase. The data phase has everything to do with data from data collection, whether you are scraping data or you have data from some resource, or you're actually leveraging publicly available data sets to then cleaning of the data because oftentimes the data is not in the perfect shape uh, that it's ready for feature extraction. But once you have cleaned the data, then we transform the data so that it is now in a numerical representation, which goes as an input to the machine learning model that you're training. And then the evaluation of the model further influences what else you can do in the data phase. Do you need more data? Do you need to clean it differently? Uh, do you need to use other data transformation techniques? So as you mentioned, features are numerical representation of data. Uh, they used to build machine learning models but they really highly depend on the data type. For instance, if you have a text corpus using word to vec to represent the phrases or the words within the text corpus as numerical representations works perfectly. But if you were to pass just random numbers through word to vec we don't really expect to get anything meaningful. 
Uh, so there are different feature generation methods that are suitable for different types of data. This gets us to audio features. Now, there are so many different audio features, and we are not going to talk about all of them, but I wanted to mention everything, or not everything, but a lot of the things on one slide. So if anybody is curious and wants to look up other things for reference, uh, it is there in one place. Let's start with two important things when we're talking about audio features, uh, spectrum and capstrum. What is spectrum? When the audio signal is passed through a Fourier transform, what results is a spectrum. But what is it essentially? It is the audio signal in the frequency domain. Uh, how we compute that is using a Fourier transform. Uh, if people are aware about Fourier series, even if not, it is just a way to represent your signals in terms of sines and cosines. Uh, and that is Fourier transform, and that helps us get the signal in the frequency domain. That is called spectrum. Now, if we take the log magnitude of the spectrum to reduce amplitude differences, and then take the inverse Fourier transform, what results is a capstrum. Now, capstrum is neither in the time domain nor in the frequency domain. Why is it not in the time domain, even though we took inverse Fourier transform, is because of the log magnitude step. Uh, and because we took inverse Fourier transform, it's not in the frequency domain. And oftentimes, people refer to this as a quefrency domain. So to show a representation of how these uh, different representations look visually, uh, there is a waveform of a simple vowel, and then the spectrum, followed by the capstrum, and then the first 20 capstrum coefficients. Now, one thing great about the capstrum is that the first few, sometimes 13, sometimes 20 coefficients, form as great features to build machine learning models. But why do we care about the frequency domain, right? Why is it that we are talking about spectrum and capstrum and uh, features associated with that? Now, the inspiration is biology, especially if you consider uh, how we even see an image. You know, what it looks to the eye is a certain thing. But for a computer to process that, uh, when our eyes see something, we see something a color like blue or green. Uh, but for a computer, they can represent it as the pixel values associated behind the image. Right? Similarly, when we hear, there's a whole process that goes on. And inspired by that is how we generate features from audio. There is the spiral uh, fluid filled structure in the ear. It's called the cochlea. It has thousands of tiny hair that are of different lengths. What happens is the longer hair resonate with sounds of lower frequencies and the shorter hair resonate with higher frequencies. So it's almost considered, because of the way uh, the signal is processed, like our ear is a natural Fourier transform analyzer. And this is why uh, spectrum, capstrum is of great interest to us. Coming from the capstrum, there are a few features that form like of great importance in uh, a lot of uh, machine learning applications. It's called the MEL frequency capstrum coefficients. Behind it is what we call the MEL filter bank, which is just those triangles as you see on the screen. Uh, now you see the triangles keep getting wider, and this is because our human ear is uh, less, less frequency selective after one kilohertz. So we want to grab less and less as we go forward. Now this filter, the aim is to represent closely how the human hearing works. And how it's mathematically produced is the spectrum of the signal passes through a MEL scale filter bank, which is those that the filter that you see on the screen, and then a log magnitude followed by a discrete cosine transform, which results in the MFCC features. The discrete cosine transform is uh, also finds application in things like JPEG compression, because the job of the discrete cosine transform is to get the shape of the signal rather than the sharper peaks, because it's known that those sharper, smaller peaks are just noise. Another capstrum coefficients is called gamma tone frequency capstrum coefficients. It's a little bit different from MFCC. As you see, the filter is now uh, with, a, with a softer slope and softer edges. Now, the inspiration here is, again, how the human hear works, uh, hearing works. And uh, this filter, gamma tone uh, filter bank, is known to be the simulation of the front end of the cochlea. So it's, again, more closely representing how we hear. And the computation is very similar, as in the spectrum passes through this filter bank. And then there are steps for downsampling and loudness compressions, followed by discrete cosine transform. And get, that gets us to our GFCC features. 
Visually, MFCC and GFCC look like this, as you can see on the screen, for same audio signal. Now we see that you know they are like mid-processing features and they do look different, they convey different information. So it's not like one is a derivative of the other, but it is uh, pro produced differently through different processes and each of them uh, convey a great deal of information when using machine learning models. They have been used individually as well as you know a combination of those two features can be used to build machine learning models as well. There's some other features that have proved to be of great importance, especially in applications of speech processing. That is linear prediction capsule coefficients, bark frequency capsule coefficients, power normalized capsule coefficients. Uh, and then there's some other which are related to the spectrum of the signal, like spectrum entropy, flux, uh, how many times it crosses zero. And then chroma features, which essentially represent the tonal content of musical audio signal. Uh, so that's what it uh, it represents. So it, it can be a very useful feature when uh, considering classifying uh, music related content. There are many tools that one can be leveraged in Python for audio processing and bindling audio machine learning classifiers. And I just wanted to list all of them in one place. So if anybody's interested for different types of audio processing, you can please check these out. Coming to the library Pi Audio Processing, it's essentially a Python library for audio analysis and classification. There are a bunch of different functions that can be performed using this library, starting from audio format conversion, because you'll see a lot of conversion methods out there work on WAV format, but your audio can be on very different formats as well. So converting it from the different formats to WAV, uh, audio visualization, you know, sometimes you may want to visualize your audio with or without building the model. So that's something that we can do with this library as well. There's some audio cleaning techniques uh, that help you remove any silence or low activity segments from your signal before you pass it into any further processing. Uh, then there are audio feature extractions uh, for MFCC that we've spoken about, GFCC spectral features and the chroma features as well. I want to say particularly when I was uh, working on this project where I wanted to use GFCC, I was having a hard time finding a Python implementation. Uh, and that's what motivated me to create this library is when I used the MATLAB code that I had and converted that to Python. Uh, and that's where this comes from. Furthermore, when once you have built your features, you can use existing scikit-learn classifiers with auto hyperparameter tuning using this library. If you want, you can also use it without the scikit-learn classifiers if you want to use it with your own custom backend. Uh, furthermore, uh, there are three pre-trained models, uh, classification audio models that are provided with this library that can help you uh, establish a baseline if you're working on similar problems of classifying audio. We remember looking at this particular uh, diagram in the beginning, which talked about machine learning at a high level. So just converting that to machine learning for audio signals and how different components uh, can be related to what we have spoken about. So in terms of data collection, you can use your own data set if you have one, but if you don't, there are many publicly available data sets and that I've attached in a resources slide that will be towards the end. Like I said, I'll be sharing the slide deck so uh, you, you can feel free to access that resource there. Secondly, uh, we have data cleaning, uh, which can be used. Uh, it, it can be con con constituent of converting audio formats, but also cleaning and removing the silence segments from the audio. So that can be done using Pi Audio Processing as well. And then transformation is the feature formation, which can be done using Pi Audio Processing using the Extract Features module. These features can be extracted to use with your own backend or uh, it can also be used with existing scikit-learn models using the run classification module, which can help you train and classify your signals and also give you statistics like confusion matrix and essentially how your classifications have run on your evaluation data set. If you're thinking of starting with such a problem, uh, let's talk about the flow. What kind of questions you would ask if you wanna do something with audio, analyze it or create a classification model. So let's say you have an audio. Does it need to be converted to wave? If so, yes, we can do that with a module present in Pi Audio Processing. Does it need to be cleaned? If so, we can use Pi Audio Processing Clean module. 
Does it need to, uh, do you need to build a scikit-learn classifier? That can be done as well using train and classify. If not, do you want to just extract the features to use with your own custom model? That can be done as well using extract features module. And then if not, do you just want to use a pre-trained model to just classify audio that you have? Uh, that can be done as well. And there are instructions in the readme to how to exactly do that. If none of that, if you just want to visualize your audio, that can be done as well using Pi Audio Processing Plot module. And if none of that, uh, please help us by creating an issue on GitHub and mention all these things that you want to do in Python for audio and that you're not able to do. Please create these issues. Please feel free to contribute uh, in terms of working on some of the existing issues as well. It's an open source project, and we very much welcome everybody's input, the community's input. Now, coming to audio classification, we have talked about the library. We've talked about some features. We've talked about what audio is. And let's get it all together by actually discussing some of the audio classification examples that have been built using Pi Audio Processing. So the first one is the audio type classification. In this problem, we'll be classifying audio into three possible classes, speech, music, birds. So the first thing uh, we do is, of course, the data that is considered. So in, in this case, we are using 50 samples each, so total of 150 samples for training. And then for testing, uh, there are 14 samples for each class. The first thing we do is train an MFCC model and keeping the classifier constant at SVM. So the MFCC generated the training confusion matrix that can be seen on the top, and it looks like it's doing pretty good. When we pass the test data through this, this, this model that was created using MFCC feature, we see music is getting classified 13 out of 14 correctly, and speech and words is 14 out of 14. So this is a good model, and it looks like MFCC has definitely uh, got uh, parts to it that help the machine learning model to really decipher between these three classes. This is what a representation looks like of the features of a speech, music, and word signal. So we can see how the feature looks, and there are like different patterns uh, associated with the different types of signals. Now, just for experimentation purposes, let's try a GFCC feature model and see if that makes any difference to the model. So the training confusion matrix still looks good. Uh, and when we test it, uh, the testing results are also pretty good. We have 14 out of 14 for music and for birds. Uh, but 12 out of 14 for uh, speech, which is a little bit different from what we had when we were training with the MFCC feature. So it looks like standalone GFCC is also contributing something to the model that helps it decipher uh, clear patterns between how music, speech, and birds look distinctly. Here's a comparison between the MFCC feature and the GFCC feature for speech, music, bird sample. And we can see it's relaying different information from the plots that we can see in front of us. Now, because they're relaying different ins information, one last experiment that I wanted to do was combine these two features together, so use them in conjunction together. And again, the training confusion matrix looks good. The testing one also looks good. Again, there, it's, it's more pretty much similar to how MFCC was performing. So further testing uh, could be used on using further new samples for speech music bird to evaluate these. But this is mainly to show off capability of the features itself while keeping the classifier constant. If one wanted to create a even further invest into this model and create an even better model, can look at more samples, the quality of data, the quantity of data, and then different classification backends. The second example that I want to talk about is the music genre classification. Now, in this case, we have 10 music genres. It's pop, metal, disco, blues, reggae, classical, rock, hip hop, country, and jazz. There are 80 samples for training the model per class, and then 20 samples per class for testing. Uh, there's a paper that was published in 2002 that used MFCC features for doing this, performing this essential classification. And I've linked that in the resources slide as well. So let's just use MFCC feature, again, keeping classifier constant as SVM to see how this performs. So it can be seen with the confusion matrix of the training side that some of the classes like metal, uh, classical, they are doing showing good numbers, doing well, but then there are some like country, uh, disco, that are not doing that great. And when we run our testing samples through this classifier that was trained using MFCC feature, 
we see uh, it's again mixed. We have classical, 18 out of 20 correctly classified, but you know, disco, blues, rock, uh, reggae, they're all uh, lower numbers. So let's see if we add features now. Now, earlier one was just MFCC, and now we do MFCC, GFCC, spectral, as well as chroma features. Now that improves our training confusion matrix significantly. All the numbers have gone up. And same thing we can notice for the testing. 20 samples each, but now we see that pop has gone up by five, more correctly classified, disco by nine, um, and country by seven. So everything has improved. So certainly adding these features added something to our model that helped to decipher between these classes better. Again, the classifier was kept constant at SVM. If the classifier is experimented with as well, the model can be further improved. To further see where their model is failing or not, the testing data can be further elaborated using confusion matrices and getting the precision recall and F1 score. So this helps you see which class is going wrong and exactly where. For example, in this case, we see uh, particularly reggae is really getting incorrectly classified as hip hop a lot. So if that was uh, somewhere, you know, we want to invest time in checking the data samples that exist, the data quantity, the data quality, that could be done. And it really depends on also what your goal is. If your goal is mainly to be able to classify pop and metal, and maybe let's say classical, then you already have a model that does a decent job for those particular classes. Uh, this is just to showcase the capability of extracting features and using classifiers, but for the things that could be tried are experimenting with the data quantity and seeing what the data sizes look like, the data quality in particular, whether there is any noisy samples, uh, other features that can be used. Also another consideration factor would be some of these uh, genres have music with vocals, so maybe some sort of detection that way. And then also other, other classifier backends can be experimented with. Lastly, I'm gonna discuss a location name classification problem. So classifying audio that is spoken location names and seeing if we are able to decipher it. So considering a very, very basic example, two spoken uh, location names, London and Boston. Now these have similarities, the number of characters that form these words, and the number of consonant uh, syllables uh, that form these words. Uh, is London and Boston. So we see in this representation right in front of us, there is something that looks different in the plot for London and Boston. So that makes us feel like, okay, well, easy, right? Uh, it looks very differentiable. Why won't a model be able to do that? But then when we uh, compare three different London spoken representations and three different Boston, basically everything on your left is London and everything on your right is Boston. So these charts, very quickly look different because you know they're spoken by different people they are different styles that one can say the same name different accents different pause locations so there's a lot of variety here that goes on in how one speaks itself so we're here we're conducting two experiments one is we are training only on female voice samples and then testing on male voice samples for training, we have 23 samples for London and 23 samples for Boston. And then for testing, we have 17 samples uh, each for London and for Boston. But we're testing on only male voice and training on only female voice. Uh, so let's see if our model can do that. Uh, we try an MFCC feature, we get a confusion matrix, we see uh, the testing and we have nine, eight, nine out of 17 for Boston correctly classified, eight out of 17 for London. Let's see if we can improve that. So we tried GFCC uh, feature and trained the model. And now we have 13 out of 17 correctly classified for uh, London and same for Boston. Further trying to improve it, adding spectral features with GFCC. Now we have 15 out of 17 correctly classified for London and 14 out of 17 for Boston. Now there's so much going on here in the sense that training is only female voice and testing is only male voice. And there is a difference because Males and females have different lengths of the vocal tracts, which leads to voices in different pitches. Uh, so there is that difference as well, uh, that we are hoping that the model is able to still pick up on the spoken representations and get past the differences in the training and the testing sample. Now, if we combine these samples and shuffle it up, and now if we're training on female and male voice and also testing on female and male voice, 
Now our data gets more representative when we're training the model. So we see even MFCC is now doing better than what it was before when we were just training on female samples and then testing on male voice samples. So now uh, we see with, with this different representation, all the models are doing better. The training confusion matrix looks much better because of the representation that we have. And all both of these experiments were done using the SVM classifier as well, just to keep the classifier constant so we are able to compare the effects of different features. Here's the very much promised resource slide. Uh, it has several links to features that we did not talk about and also some of the papers that I mentioned, uh, the music genre classification uh, and the audio data sets uh, where you can find publicly available open source data sets. Finally, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jyotika. And uh, we have some questions for you. Um, the first one is, do you think this toolkit could be useful for other vibrational analysis? Like uh, the example they give is uh, seismic signal processing, earthquakes. That is a very, very interesting uh, thought. So because this library deals with mainly audio, if you're talking about any audio effects of these signals, or any patterns that are audible that you can hear, then I think it's definitely worth a try. I have personally not uh, you know, heard of that uh, application before, but it sounds very interesting. And if there's any audible uh, component to it, I would definitely give it a shot. There's another question that asks, do you think this toolkit um, so is Pi Audio Processing language agnostic or is it just for English? Oh, so, well, it's actually, it doesn't matter. So uh, the Pi Audio Processing library is essentially written in Python, but what language or audio is in, it does not matter because it's gonna train on the samples you provide. So if your samples are in English, it's gonna train on that data. So it really depends on the data that you pass in rather than the library. The library should be expected to do similar. And how do you deal with noisy data? So is there, um, have you considered automated noise classification and cleaning to any degree? Yeah, that's a very good question. Noise is a very, uh, uh, I would say, frustrating component of just dealing with anything classification and dealing with data. Uh, that's a good question. And I think one thing about noise, some components are very basic and simple, where you just have a signal where the interest is in a very particular segments and the audio itself is long. So that way, uh, it's more simpler solutions like removing of the silent segments. But then there are other uh, aspects to removing noise like spectral subtraction, in which uh, you would just take the full audio and take the less, uh, less I would say, component filled portions, see what the signal looks like there and just subtract that from the entire signal to remove noises such as something going on in the background, you know, the, like train noise, car noise, just something going on in the background. So I think it's a very interesting application and there has been the use of MFCC features a bunch to even remove noise from data uh, as features in GFCC as well, especially in speaker identification when there are noisy samples provided, these features help you uh, clean them up as well. We have um, a lot of questions on Venueless and uh, the next one is, you've mentioned M MFCC and GFCC features. Uh, what are the implications for classifying speech features in people like accents, the age of the speaker, and maybe other features? Very good question as well. So there are a lot of applications of these features itself in like gender classification uh, and so on. GFCC specifically is very useful for speaker identification as well. So if you wanna have a task where you wanna differentiate between people in terms of in different age groups as well, I would definitely give that a shot. And then there's PNCC, BFCC, there are other textual coefficients that really help uh, break down your signal and classify it into types as such, especially when it's considered, uh, when it has speaker information associated. Um, what's the visualization plotting stack uh, based on for Pi Audio Processing? is another question from the audience. Can you, can, you, can you repeat that? Sorry. What's the visualization and plotting stack based on for Pi oh, Audio Processing? Yes, it's a good question. So it's mainly uh, scikit-learn and matplotlib. And essentially, if you have your features or any data that you want to visualize, once you have the data, you know, visualizing is uh, can be done with anything like matplotlib, Seaborn, any of, any of your favorite visualization libraries. 
And uh, the final question, we still have time for it. So people asking, were the music samples entire songs or were you only clipping part of the song? And if you did both, does the length of the sample have uh, an effect on model performance? That's a very good question. The length of the sample, unless it's like really short and does not convey much information, would not have a very significant impact because you're windowing the signal and that's where you're extracting features and then averaging it out for your signal. The data set specifically I used was entire audios and it's called the GTZAN data set. And I've also attached a link in the resources slide to this data set, which contains all these genres. So if you want to explore the particular data set, it's, it's going to be right there. Thank you so much, Jyotika Singh. Thank you for speaking at PyCon AU 2021. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for organizing the whole thing. And uh, for our audience now at home, we have a bit of a break. And we'll be back at, let me check, at 1.30 Melbourne time with Graph Data Science and Paco Nathan. See you then.